Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started this morning by welcoming you guys. Sawadee Kaab, Sawadee Kaab, welcome to everyone. Today is our group learning program and we're studying the 10 fetters and the four stages of enlightenment. The 10 fetters are the 10 individual pollutions that the Buddha discovered in the unenlightened mind. And he provides you the tools and techniques of how to eradicate these from the mind. And as you do so, that's where the mind will actually move through the stages of enlightenment and to enlightenment itself, where the mind can be peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy, no longer experiencing any discontent feelings. So here at the very beginning of the group learning program, what I'm going to be doing as part of our, I guess this is our fourth or fifth class now, I'm going to be introducing you to the 10 fetters because this is kind of the underlying thing that everything that the teachings of the Buddha are guiding you to do is to eliminate these 10 fetters. So as getting started on the path to enlightenment and getting started on this journey to enlightenment, you would need to understand these 10 fetters individually, at least as an introductory level. That's what I'm going to be sharing with you today. And then we'll be talking about the four stages of enlightenment. And then later in someone's development, they will typically go much deeper into the 10 fetters because when you're first getting started on the path to enlightenment, you're learning the core central teachings of the Buddha, which is like the Eightfold Path, which includes the Four Noble Truths, the Three Universal Truths, the Five Precepts, meditation training, a lot of things like this. But underneath all of that is the 10 fetters. So that's why we're going to be talking about it today, helping you get an introduction to these 10 individual fetters. We're going to start our class with meditation, which is how we typically will start most of our classes. I'm going to start by chanting to ease us into the meditation, which you guys are welcome to join if you like. We have the chanting sheets over there on the table. If you'd like to have a chanting sheet and chant along, you're welcome to see those. They're in the Pali language, and this language is the original language that the teachings of the Buddha are captured in. And as I chant these, this isn't a rite or ritual or a ceremony or worship or anything like that. This is just a way to ease the mind into meditation, actually get more benefit out of the meditation itself. And I teach these at different times during the various courses and retreats that I teach. And you'll see the English translations on there as well. And then after the chanting, I will move into providing you some guidance for meditation. And then after that, there'll be a period of time where it'll just be quiet. We'll just all be meditating together. All of us here and then everyone who's joining us online will just be meditating together. I'm sure you hear an occasional noise or something like this, but you'll be able to just bring your mind back to the breath if you can train your mind to let go, let go, let go. And then we'll come out of the meditation with some chanting. And this will conclude our meditation and then we'll move into sharing teachings that are going to help you to understand the 10 fetters and the four stages of enlightenment. So if you'd like to join for meditation, you might be seated on the floor or seated in a chair. Oftentimes when you're on the floor, you have a cushion under your rear. This helps get the hips up in the air and lessens the angle at the hips, the knees, and the ankles. You would like the legs to just be lightly crossed. Some people like to put their legs off the mat, which helps to get the hips up in the air as well. And then the hands and the arms. The Buddha put his right hand over his left with his thumbs together, and he put this into his lap. And if this is comfortable, you could use this, but it's not about everybody doing it exactly the same way. Some people like to put their palms on their thighs, or in their knees or their palms up. Some people just like to rest their hands comfortably in their lap. And then if you're in a chair, people typically will place their feet flat on the floor or lightly cross at the ankles. And then again, put your hands and arms wherever you're comfortable. The upper body should be erect. This keeps the mind attentive and alert during the meditation. It also helps you to be able to breathe in through the nose and out through the nose. Whereas if you were slouched, the mind would have a tendency to be dull or lethargic. But if you were real rigid with the upper body, the mind might be overactive or uptight. So you'd like the upper body to be erect so that you can breathe in naturally. And then also the mind can be attentive and alert during the meditation. So again, I'm going to ease into meditation with some chanting and then I'll be back with some guidance to help you. Arahang <laughs> Savakato emakwata ramo Namang namasami Supatipano emakwato 
Sāvaka Sāngkho Sāngkhāng Namāmi Nāp-mūr-ha-sāp-ha-kā-vā-tū Ārā-tū Sāmā-sāmputā-sā Nāp mūr ha sā pā kā vā tū Ā rā tū sāmā sāmputā sā Nāp mūr ha sā pā kā vā tū Āratū sammā samputāsā Āiti pīsū mahākavā Āratāng sammā sammūtū Vī chā chā rā nāng sā mūnū Sā kā tō rū kā vī tū Anu te rū pū rī sā Dāma sā tī sā tā tā vāp manu Sanang Puto Pakawati Okay, with the lower body and hands and arms comfortable and the upper body erect just close the eyes and start breathing in through the nose and out through the nose. Here you're just looking to establish the breath. A nice, natural, steady, consistent breath. Not forced or controlled. Just a gradual inhale through the nose experiencing the full breath. And then when you're ready, exhale out through the nose. Breathing in. And out. Breathing in and out. Your breath may not match up with the guidance that I'm providing, and that's okay. This is your practice. I'm just here for guidance. You can use this voice as a reminder that whenever you get to the next inhale, breathe in gradually through the nose, developing a nice, natural, steady, consistent breath. And then whenever you're ready, exhale out through the nose, experiencing the full breath. Breathing in and out. Breathing in and out.
With the breath well established, start fixating the mind on the breath. Either the sound of the breath coming into the nose or the sensation of air moving over the skin into the nose. The breath is the present moment. Fixate the mind on the breath, the present moment. Breathing in. And out. Breathing in and out. With the mind fixated on the breath, whenever you notice that it moves off the breath, cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath, the present moment. No need to observe your thoughts, label them, judge them, analyze them, or even try to figure out where they're coming from. Whenever you notice that the mind is moved off the breath, cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath, the present moment. Breathing in. and out. Breathing in and out. I'm going to be quiet now and let you do this work of focusing on the breath cutting off and letting go anytime the mind moves off the breath. You have nowhere to go. There's nothing to do. No one needs you right now. This is your time to focus on the breath. Breathing in and out.
slowly make your way out of meditation. Once again, welcome to all of you guys here at the temple. Welcome to everyone online. Welcome to everyone who's joining us. The Those of you guys that are here for the very first time, I'd like you to know that there's a bathroom in the back of the room. It's the very last door on the right. You're welcome to use it at any time. We even have bathrooms outside the classroom. You can follow the main signs around to the temple bathroom. And we have water here that's provided by our students that you're welcome to help yourself to at any time. Just make yourself at home. As I mentioned, today's topic is the 10 fetters and the four stages of enlightenment. This is something that you need in order to understand, in order to make your way to enlightenment, that everything that the Buddha is teaching you is to eradicate these 10 fetters or pollutions or taints or defilements that the Buddha discovered in the unenlightened mind. So while meditation is important and you need to meditate and you wouldn't be able to get to enlightenment without meditation, you also wouldn't be able to get to enlightenment with only meditation either. You're going to need other things like some of the things that I'm going to be teaching you today, but there's a lot of things that you're going to need to learn and understand. And when you're learning the teachings of the Buddha, you're not believing his teachings. They're not a bunch of beliefs that you believe that you hope something good's going to happen when you die. Die. Instead, you're learning teachings now, you're reflecting on them to independently verify them, and you're practicing them. So as I'm talking today about these fetters, you'll be able to hear what it is that I'm sharing with you, and you'll be able to directly reflect on your own life and what you've been experiencing throughout your life, and you'll be able to see how your mind has these 10 individual fetters. You shouldn't believe that these fetters are there. I can assure you that all of these 10 fetters are in your mind because your mind is unenlightened. So you're going to have these 10 individual fetters. And as you learn what they are and you learn about how to eradicate them and you uplift them and eliminate them from the mind, this is where the peace and the joy comes into the mind. If you notice that you lack concentration sometimes, that you lack focus, that you lack clarity, that you have difficulties with your memory, this is because of these pollutions that are in the mind. If you notice that you have difficulties in certain 
relationships where maybe you're maybe bitter or harsh or hostile, or maybe uh, you feel resentful or jealous or sad or angry or frustrated or agitated or any of these other kind of discontent feelings that are experienced in the unenlightened mind. It's all because of these pollutions that I'm going to share with you. Don't think of yourself as a bad person or you've done anything wrong. There's no guilt or shame that you need to feel because of these things. But every single unenlightened being, that every being that's ever been born has been unenlightened. And every single unenlightened being has all of these 10 fetters in their mind. So you're going to need to eradicate them in order to get to enlightenment where you can experience the peace and the joy that is permanent. So as you're going through and learning any of the teachings of the Buddha, you can see how every single aspect of his teachings is coming back to these 10 fetters and helping you to learn how to eradicate them from the mind. And as you're gradually diminishing these poisons or these pollutions or these defilements from the mind, this is where you'll notice the peace and the joy coming through. You'll notice this brightness and this radiance coming through in the mind. So as I go today, you're welcome to ask any and all questions. You can ask questions here at the temple by using the microphones here that are in front of the camera. If you just get a microphone, you press the gray button, you'll see the lights come on. Just wait a second or so and hold it up to your chin and we'll be able to hear you here at the temple and they'll be able to hear you online as well. And then you're welcome to keep the microphone with you because you'll probably need it more than once perhaps or maybe someone around you might need the microphone so you can share it around. And for those of you guys that are online, you can ask questions by putting that into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom. Or in Zoom, you can electronically raise your hand. You can open up your microphone and we'll be able to hear you here at the temple and they'll be able to hear you on the live stream as well. So to get, to get us started, there's these 10 individual fetters. They're referred to as a fetter because during ancient times, they would put a fetter around your ankle in order to keep you trapped as a prisoner. Nowadays, we have jail cells. So we put prisoners into a jail cell. But back during ancient times, it was just open land and they would put a fetter around your ankle, which would be a shackle, a chain, and a heavy ball. And this would keep you confined to a certain area. So the Buddha describes these 10 pollutions in the mind as fetters because they're keeping the mind trapped in the unenlightened state. And as long as these fetters are there, the mind's going to experience the difficulties and struggles of life. But when you eliminate these, you'll find that life is such ease, right? That is so peaceful, that is so joyful because your mind's no longer functioning with these pollutions. When you have a polluted mind, then you're looking out at the world through this dirty window and everything can look very dirty. But when you clear off your window, you look out at the world and it's quite bright, it's quite clean. But of course, there are certain challenges that exist in the world, but the challenges that you're experiencing with your painful feelings like sadness, anger, frustration, it's not coming from the outside world. It's not your mom or your dad or your boss or your life partner, your children. It's not the weather. It's not anything around you that is causing your mind to be discontent. It's what's going on inside your own mind that's causing the mind to be discontent. Namely, these 10 fetters, these 10 pollutions, or these defilements are also referred to as taints. So as I go through and explain them, as I mentioned, don't just believe what I'm sharing, but you can directly reflect on your experiences and you can see how you have each one of these individual fetters. In this particular class, I'm just going to give you an intro to each of these because it's the very beginning of the group learning program where students just learned the Eightfold Path in detail. This is kind of like an overview. As you get deeper into the various courses and retreats that I share, particularly the retreat that I teach in January and the one that I teach in August, this is where we go into detail about each individual fetter. And that's a time where you'll actually need to go into each one of these fetters. In the August retreat, I'm going to spend an hour to an hour and a half on each one of these individual fetters. Today, I'll probably spend, you know, maybe 10 minutes on each individual fetter. But at the beginning of a program like this, that's really all you need is just an introduction. Because what you'll need to understand is that this is kind of like the engine inside the mind that is causing the mind to experience all these discontent feelings. And the teachings of the Buddha are kind of overlaying that and helping you learn how to uproot these and eradicate them from the mind. And that's where the mind, having eliminated these fetters that's keeping the mind burdened in the unenlightened state, will start experiencing the brightness and the radiance and the joy. So this first one here, it's called personal existence view. This is part of the lower fetters. And then I'm going to show you the higher fetters as well. What personal existence view is, is this is the pollution or the defilement or the taint where the mind is falsely believing that this body 
or this mind is you and who you are, that there's a certain self-image that the mind is clinging to, and it's holding on to this self-image, wanting to be perceived in the world in a certain way, thinking that this body is who you are. And there's a certain self-identity that the mind is holding on to, thinking that this is who you are. And the mind is confused and having this misunderstanding or misperception that the mind thinks that this body is you. So therefore, when you hear someone say something agreeable to you about this physical body, you'll get pleasant feelings. You'll get happy. You'll get excited. If they say, oh, you're so beautiful or, oh, I really like the colors of your eyes or, oh, that jewelry looks so wonderful on you or the color of that shirt really looks really nice, or, oh, your hair looks so great today, you look so beautiful, you'll get all these pleasant feelings based on the condition that somebody has now said something that is positive and agreeable to you. And the mind's clinging to this self-image, thinking that this is who you are. But then, because of impermanence, it's only a matter of time before somebody says something negative or degrading about this self-image, where when they say something that's disagreeable to you, now you're going to feel painful feelings. You're going to feel sad or angry or frustrated or agitated because you based your pleasant feelings on the condition of hearing agreeable things. Now, when that changes, the unenlightened mind doesn't like that. The unenlightened mind wants to be perceived through personal existence view in a certain way. It wants to be perceived by the world and perceived by others in a certain way. And when that is happening the way the mind wants, and it's agreeable, it'll experience the pleasant feelings. But when it's not getting what it wants, when it's not being perceived in the world a certain way, it will experience painful feelings like sadness, anger, frustration, and others. So let me give you some examples of this related to the self-image. That if you've ever been to a social situation and you spilled like pizza sauce or chocolate ice cream on your clothes and you experienced embarrassment, this is because of personal existence view, that you were embarrassed because you weren't being perceived in the way that you wanted to be perceived, that you had this spaghetti sauce or this pizza sauce or this chocolate ice cream or something on your clothing, and now other people are looking at you and you're perceiving that this body is you and this is who you are as a person, and now you're not being perceived by others the way you want to be perceived. You're wanting permanently to be appearing a certain way to other people, and now when the mind's getting what it wants, it gets pleasant feelings. But when it doesn't get what it wants, it gets painful feelings. This is all associated with the personal existence view. If you've ever looked in the mirror and you saw a pimple or you saw, saw a mole or you saw a wrinkle or a gray hair or something like this, or you saw a little bit of fat here and there and you were shaken up by that, this is because of personal existence view. The mind's not being perceived the way that it wants to be perceived. It thinks that this body is you and it's falsely believing that and it's having this misperception or this misunderstanding. It's clinging and holding on to this body and it can't be perceived in the world a one particular way permanently because this body is impermanent. It's constantly changing, right? So if you're getting gray hair or you're losing your hair, you might feel discontent. You might feel angry or frustrated or agitated or annoyed or disappointed or some other feeling like this. But this body is impermanent. So as long as you're clinging to it, wanting it to be permanent, when you're not being perceived in the world the way that you want to be perceived, you'll be shaken up by that. And then there's a self-identity that the mind's clinging to, and it's unique to each individual person. Oftentimes it's around your culture, your ethnicity, your sexual orientation, maybe your nationality or your job or your occupation. Your mind will cling to these things thinking that this is who you are, like I am American or I am Chinese or I am Swedish, or I am from the Netherlands, or I am Thai, or I am Japanese, or I am Indian, or I am Canadian, or I am Australian, right? All of this I am, I am, or I am a police officer, I am a lawyer, I am a Buddhist teacher, right? Any kind of I am around your culture, ethnicity, your sexual orientation, your nationality, maybe a job or occupation, if you're clinging to anything, thinking that this is who you are, is your self-identity, once again, if you hear something agreeable, you'll get pleasant feelings, happy, excited, elated. All Chinese people are so friendly and loving and kind, ah, or all Canadians are so happy and friendly, oh, I enjoy being around Canadian people. Well, if I am Canadian and the mind identifies that way and you hear that agreeable thing, you'll get pleasant feelings. 
But then it's only a matter of time before somebody says something degrading and disparaging because you can't control what other people say or what other people do. You could be at a dinner table at a restaurant and two or three tables over, somebody could say something degrading and disparaging about Americans or Japanese people or Chinese people or whatever country you're from, whatever identity you're holding on to. And now two or three tables over when they're degrading people from that country, if you think I am Chinese or I am American or I am Thai, now they're talking about you. That's what the way your mind perceives it. And now you'll get angry and frustrated and agitated because you think that they're degrading and disparaging you. When in reality, what the Buddha is describing to you is that there is no you. There is no you here. This is the solution to personal existence view. The mind's going to misunderstand this body and or this mind as being who you are. But this is because of the personal existence view. This is because of the pollution. This is a somewhat of a challenging one for the mind to understand when you're first getting started on the path to enlightenment because you've been taught your whole life and your mind has been conditioned to believe that this body is you or that this mind is you. In fact, we were all given a name at birth. We were given a label. The label I was given was David. I am David, right? And there's a certain label. And each one of us were given a label at birth. And now we start associating with that label in terms of the clothing we wear, in terms of the jewelry, in terms of the way we do our hair, our personality, our character. We start associating with this label as who we are. And now if somebody says something wonderful, like all people who are named David are so friendly and kind and loving and whatever. Ah, well, if I am David, they're talking about me. Or then when someone says something degrading and disparaging, that's where the painful feelings come in, right? If you've ever been in a relationship with a boyfriend or girlfriend and you identified with I am a boyfriend or I am a girlfriend or I am a husband or I am a wife, when you guys were together, you felt quite nice. But then when you guys separated and you're no longer a boyfriend or girlfriend or you're no longer a husband or wife, you might have really struggled during that time or you might still be struggling and you might feel like you want to hurry up and get right back into another relationship because this identity of I am a boyfriend, I am a girlfriend, the mind's clinging to that and thinking that that's who you are. And now when you're single and you're not with a, another person, you, you don't feel quite comfortable in the world. You don't quite feel whole. You might feel like you don't even know who your true self is. Some people say, I don't even know who I am anymore. I don't even know who I am. I need to go find my true self. Well, the solution to personal existence view is to gain the understanding that this body isn't you. It's not who you are as a person. It's just physical structures. It's just skin and bones and muscle tissue and fluid. It, none of that is you. It's not who you are. And it's constantly changing. And this self-identity that the mind's holding on to, this isn't you either. I am not a Buddhist teacher. I share the teachings of the Buddha. That's what I do. And that's the role that I'm currently fulfilling in this community. But that's not who I am as a person, right? So if I thought that I am a Buddhist teacher, when people say things wonderful about Buddhist teachers, I get pleasant feelings. But then when people said something disgrading or disparaging about Buddhist teachers, I'd be angry and frustrated. So you can understand that, for example, this body was born in America. I understand that, that this body was born in a place that we refer to as America. But the mind doesn't have to adopt the identity of I am an American, just like I can fulfill the role of sharing the teachings of the Buddha, but I don't have to adopt the identity of I am a Buddhist teacher. So this personal existence view is where the pollution of the mind has this confusion or this delusion or this misunderstanding or misperception that it doesn't understand true reality. It's going to keep clinging to this body and this mind thinking that this is who you are. And there's a solution to this. It's called the universal truth of non-self is where you realize that this body isn't you and you realize that this mind isn't you. And then you can be peaceful and you can be joyful because if somebody says something complimentary about your physical appearance, okay, you might say thank you. You might say I appreciate your, your kindness, but your mind doesn't experience these conditional pleasant feelings because of it. But if somebody says something degrading and disparaging about this physical body, your mind's not shaken up by it because you know that this body isn't you. Same thing about your self-identity. If somebody says something wonderful about your nationality, okay, all Chinese people are friendly and loving, okay. All Spanish people, all Mexican people, all Brazilian people are friendly and loving, okay, that's that person's opinion. 
But now somebody says something degrading and disparaging about these things. Okay, that's their opinion, but they're not talking about me. If somebody says something degrading and disparaging about American people, okay, that's up to them. That's their opinion. But they're not talking about me because my mind doesn't identify with I am an American, right? So you can liberate your mind from these feelings of where it's going up and down and up and down based on this personal existence view. I even had a student one time contact me a few months ago where they are consider themselves a good tipper. They say, I am a good tipper. I am a great tipper. And then now they're going into these various stores and these various environments where they're showing them a computer and they have to press a certain tip. And it's maybe like a coffee shop where they spend like 30 seconds ordering a coffee and then they get their coffee. And these people are asking for a tip because you have to press a button on the computer in order to give them a tip. And this person says, gosh, I feel so conflicted. I feel so bad going into this environment because I don't tip them because I think that I've only spent 30 seconds with them. Why do I need to tip them? They just took my order, gave me the coffee, no big deal. And he felt so conflicted. He felt so, uh, you know, shaken up by this because his mind identified with, I am a great tipper. So when he's tipping and he's giving a tip, he feels good. But when he's not giving a tip, he doesn't feel good. He's not, his identity has been, is not intact, right? So this is the challenge that the mind can cling to many things. Yes, culture, ethnicity, sexual orientation, nationality, occupation, but there's all these other things that your mind can cling to. Even I am a kind person, you could cling to that. And now when people think of you as a kind person, you feel pleasant feelings. But then if someone says, gosh, you're the meanest person I've ever met, right? You're going to be all shaken up by that because you identify with, I am a kind person. So the mind can cling to all kinds of different personal existence view that you're going to ultimately have to peer into and see that none of this stuff defines who you are. You can get liberated from all these kinds of things. So when someone's degrading and disparaging this physical body or this mind, you might still choose to not spend time with this person because it's unwise to be around people who are unwholesome and negative and degrading and disparaging, but your mind won't be shaken up by it. You won't be angry and frustrated and agitated by this person, right? Because your mind has been liberated from this pollution of thinking that this body or this mind is who you are. So you can reflect on something like this and all the other teachings of the Buddha and independently verify them. The way that I guide students to independently reflect on personal existence view is think about yourself when you were a child, when you were a teenager, early adulthood, and then now. Think about how you viewed yourself, right? Has it been constantly the same throughout all of that period of time or has it been constantly changing? Right? Have you viewed yourself differently as a child, as a teenager, as an early adult, and then now? Or have you viewed yourself the same way all the way through? What would you say? Has it been the same or has it been different? It's been different, right? It's been impermanent, right? So if this body or this mind is you and the mind's clinging to it and this is who you are, then it would stay the same, right? There would be a permanent self, but there is no permanent self. Another way you can think about it is to determine whether this body is you or not, is if your arm was amputated and you only had one hand and one arm, are you less of a person? Saying no, shaking your head no over here. Are you less of a person if you only have one hand and one arm? You say no? Okay. You say no? Okay. Yeah, so there you go. You see intellectually, you understand that this body isn't you. It's not who you are. But your mind has this confusion that when you go out in the world and somebody compliments you, you feel all great. But then when somebody says something degrading or disparaging about this body, you'll feel deflated or depleted or you'll feel angry or frustrated. So intellectually, you can understand that this body isn't you, which is what you just answered. You said, Yes, my arm is amputated. I only have one hand and one arm. I'm not less of a person. Well, if this body is you, you would have said, yes, I'm less of a person because I have less of an arm and a hand, right? But that's not the case. Intellectually, understand that this body isn't you. But the mind's confusion, the misunderstanding, the misperception is in the situation where somebody's either complimenting this physical body or or saying something degrading or disparaging. That's where the mind gets shaken up because of this pollution this personal existence view.
And then a third way that you can independently verify that there is no self and that this personal existence view can be eradicated is think about who you are. Like point to yourself. Where are you? Can you point? Nobody's pointing. So maybe you guys all realize non-self. Oftentimes people will point here, right? They'll point here, they'll point here. They'll say, I am here, right? This is me. This is who I am. Okay, so we'll look at what we're pointing at. We're pointing at a shirt. Is this shirt you? Those clothes you're wearing? Is that who you are? Ask yourself, is this clothes you? Is that you? Most people say, no, those clothes aren't me. Okay, we'll say I took off the clothes, held it up, threw it away, right? Got rid of the clothes. All right, well, where are you? So on my point again. All right, what are we pointing to? We're pointing to skin, right? This is skin. Okay, so if we take off the skin and we hold that up, is that who you are? Are you the skin that you've got right there? Is that you? You're saying no, that's not you, right? The skin's not you. No, that's not you. Okay, so let's throw away the skin. Where are you? Point to yourself. Where are you? So on my point again. Okay, we've got bones, we got muscle tissue, we've got fluid and organs. None of those bits and pieces and parts are you. It's not who you are, right? But the unrelated mind's clinging to all of this stuff, thinking that this is who you are. And what the Buddha's helping you to be able to see is no, none of this stuff is you. It's not who you are. But remember, as long as this pollution is there, the mind's going to be confused. It's going to have this misperception, this misunderstanding. It's going to think that this is who you are. So you're going to need to train your mind to let this go. And when we get to chapter 16 in this group learning program, in volume one, chapter 16, we dive into personal existence view very closely because it's part of the ego. And then I also discuss it and share teachings at other points during the various programs that I share. So personal existence view is oftentimes a challenging one for the mind to understand. But as you do understand it, then you will come to understand that, yes, this body isn't you. This mind isn't you. It's not who you are. Okay, so this is the very first fetter. Then the second one is called doubt. Doubt is where you have doubt about the Buddha, the teachings, the community that you're part of, your teacher, or your own ability to get to enlightenment, right? This is a very common thing that when an individual comes to the path to enlightenment, they have doubt. Did this person, the Buddha, even exist, right? Does enlightenment even exist? Do these teachings even exist? Is it even possible? Is this community going to be supportive and helpful for me to get to enlightenment? Does my teacher even know how to have the ability to help me get to enlightenment? Or do I have the ability, you yourself, do you have the ability to get to enlightenment? You might have doubt about whether this is even possible or not right? So this doubt will hinder you from being able to get to enlightenment. As long as you have doubt, then you will continue to struggle because the mind has doubt. The way that you eliminate doubt about the teachings of the Buddha is not through faith. It's not through belief. That's not how you eliminate doubt about the teachings. The way that you eliminate doubt about his teachings is you investigate them. You examine them. If you investigate and examine them, if you learn his teachings and you don't believe them, and you reflect on them to independently verify them, and then you practice them, meaning you integrate them into your life, and you start practicing them, and you start uprooting these pollutions out of the mind, you'll get to a point where you have no doubt that these teachings are leading to enlightenment, because you will have seen significant improvement to the condition of your mind, that you will have known that when you were off the path to enlightenment, you experienced a certain amount of struggles and difficulties. You experienced a certain amount of anger and sadness and frustration and stress and anxiety and all these other discontent feelings. And as you've been learning those teachings and integrating them into your life and uprooting the pollution out of your mind, you're going to start seeing the peace and the joy coming into the mind. And as you do, you'll eventually get to a point where you have no doubt that these teachings are leading to your enlightenment. You're not enlightened yet by the time you eliminate doubt, but you'll get to a point where you have confirmed confidence in the Buddha, the teachings, the community, your teacher, 
and your own ability to get to enlightenment because you've seen enough progress to the condition of the mind. So this comes through investigation and examination of the teachings. It doesn't come through belief or faith or anything like that. You can't believe your way to enlightenment because with belief, you don't know what's true or false. You need to be able to get to wisdom. That's when you actually will be able to transform your mind. And the way you get to wisdom is through learning, through reflecting to independently verify teachings and then practicing. But as long as you have doubt, you'll struggle, you'll waver. You're not quite sure whether I should meditate, not quite sure if I should go to the temple, not quite sure if I should pick up the book, not quite sure if I can get to enlightenment or if I have enough time to get to enlightenment. There'll be doubt in the mind and it'll hinder you and obstruct at you from being able to continue to make progress. So you need to eradicate any complacency and arise this determination, this dedication, this diligence, and build more and more confidence in the teachings. And the way that you do that is through investigating them, reading books, listening to podcasts, watching videos, coming to classes like this, talking to your teacher privately, meditating, these kinds of things. But you need to be sure that you're learning with the original words of the Buddha. We are now 2,500 years away from the death of the Buddha. And you would think that everybody in the world who is considering themselves Buddhist is learning the original words of the Buddha. But this isn't actually true. There's a very small, small, small portion of the world that is learning with the original words of the Buddha. The vast majority of the people in the world don't even know the original words of the Buddha, don't have access to them. Out of all the places I've ever been, which I've been to over 200 Buddhist temples in my life, I've only ever been to one that shares the original teachings of the Buddha. And this is less than 1%. If you do the math of one temple out of over 200, that's less than 1%. You would think that every Buddhist monk must be studying the original words of the Buddha. This isn't true. Very few of them actually study the original words of the Buddha. This is unfortunate, but it's the case in the situation of where we're at now, 2,500 years after the death of the Buddha. So you're going to need to be sure that you're studying the original words of the Buddha. And that's why I make them available to you at no cost. All the books that I share, they have the original words of the Buddha in there. You can download them for free. There's no cost. You can take it and go print it yourself. You can get printed copies here by just reimbursing us for our printing costs. Or you can order them on Amazon if you're country has access to Amazon. By studying the original words of the Buddha, you'll be able to see what he did teach and what he didn't teach. And that's how you can investigate and examine his teachings and ultimately eradicate this doubt. And you'll have then confirmed confidence in the Buddha, confirmed confidence in his teachings, confirmed confidence in the community, because this community will support you and help you and encourage you along. You need to do the work, but you'll learn things from the community. You'll learn things from me, but you also learn things from other people. You'll see that they're polite and kind and friendly and respectful. They're generous, they're loving and kind and compassionate and friendly and warm. And you'll be like, wow, I really like the way that person is doing that. And you'll choose to do those kinds of things too. And it will help you to gain wisdom of how to practice in the world. So this doubt is something that you can eradicate through your examination and investigation of the teachings. Then there's the third one here, which is called wrong behavior and observances. What this is, is referring to the moral conduct that you choose to practice in the world. The first part of this is this wrong behavior. And this word wrong is kind of like, you know, kind of a little bit challenging for some people to wrap their mind around, but think about it as unwise behavior, right? That there's a certain amount of unwise behavior in the unenlightened state. That if you're bitter or harsh or hostile or aggressive or rude or impolite or unkind to people, as you're putting that out, that's what's going to come back to you. <clears throat> so what this fetter is, is there's two sides to it. This wrong behavior is where you're having speech actions or a livelihood which is unwise and as you're putting out certain harm through your speech or actions in your livelihood this is all coming back to you <clears throat> so by the time you eliminate wrong behavior you will be practicing the eightfold path with right speech right action and right livelihood to that level of detail if you remember back to the moral conduct section which i taught two weeks ago the buddha teaches right speech about lying slandering harsh speech and frivolous speech these are things that are all based in your own craving, desire, attachment. So if you eliminate your craving, desire, attachment, and you purify your speech and your communication, you wouldn't be lying because that's going to cause you harm. If you 
have slander or gossip, that's going to cause people harm. It's going to cause you harm. If you speak harshly, like your tone, your tempo, and your word choice, this is going to cause other people harm. So it's going to cause you harm. And then also when you speak frivolously, which is like idle chatter, just yada, 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 without purpose or without any kind of benefit. So you would like to purify your speech and your communication to that level of detail where you're practicing those four aspects of right speech. And then right action is ensuring you're not causing any harm through your bodily actions. And the Buddha gives you guidance on right action in terms of eliminating the killing, the stealing, and sexual misconduct. And you can see that through the five precepts, which I teach on chapter seven when we get to that point. Remember, these aren't rules. These aren't commandments. He's not telling you or dictating to you what you should do. He's helping you to understand the natural law of gamma, of cause and effect or action and result, that when you make unwise decisions, it's going to produce unwholesome results. But when you make wise decisions, it's going to produce wholesome results for you. So when you wisely choose not to kill living beings, then this is going to produce wholesome results for you because it's going to help you eliminate ill will and anger from the mind. When you choose to not steal, then it's going to help you eliminate craving, desire, attachment. When you choose to not have sexual misconduct, it's also going to help you to eliminate craving, desire, attachment. You'll notice more and more peace coming into the mind because you're not causing harm, so harm isn't coming back to you. And then with your livelihood, there's teachings that I taught there about business in weapons, business and living beings, business and meat, business and substances that cause heedlessness and poisons. And then also eliminating scheming, flattering, belittling, hinting, pursuing gain with gain. These are all things that an individual could potentially do in their livelihood that's going to cause harm to other people. And now you're going to have a hard time sustaining your livelihood. So these are all things that we talked about about two weeks ago. So if you can purify your moral conduct to that level, you will have eliminated the wrong behavior part of this particular fetter. And you'll take you time to build up your ability to do that, particularly if there's craving in the mind, because that's why people typically will lie or have slander or have harsh speech or have frivolous speech because there's craving, desire, attachment in the mind. Same thing. The reason why someone's killing or stealing or having sexual misconduct is because of craving, desire, attachment. The same thing with anything in your livelihood that you might be experiencing that oftentimes there's craving, desire, attachment that is motivating those kinds of things. So you can clean up your moral conduct. And by doing so, you'll see improved results coming back to you. As long as you're being harsh and bitter and hostile to other people around you, this is what's all going to come back to you. So oftentimes we think the way to fix our life is to go around and fix other people. We've got to fix mom. We got to fix dad. We got to fix brother and sister. That's the problem. No, the problem is actually inside your own mind. As long as you're bitter and harsh and hostile or practicing wrong speech, wrong action and wrong livelihood, you're going to experience this harms coming back to you because you're practicing in a way that is unwise. And in the unenlightened state, you just don't understand what you don't understand. So you will tend to do these kinds of things without realizing that it's producing unwholesome results for you. Then the wrong observances part here, what this is, is this is the rites and rituals and ceremonies and worship that somebody will believe that these kinds of things are leading to purification of the mind or some kind of benefit in your life. So if you're doing rites, rituals, ceremonies and worship, or you're around people that are doing those kinds of things, that's not going to lead to wisdom. That's not going to improve the condition of your mind. So if somebody's sprinkling water on you or you're sprinkling water on yourself or you're eating a wafer or you're tying strings on your wrist or any of these other kind of rites, rituals, ceremonies and worship, none of this is actually leading to your enlightenment. In fact, it's actually hindering you because as long as the mind believes that these kinds of things are going to produce some kind of benefit in your life, you won't actually be focusing on the real thing that's going to actually produce benefit, which is to acquiring wisdom. You need to be able to acquire wisdom because now with more wisdom, your mind will awaken and now you'll make wiser decisions that's producing wholesome results. But as long as somebody believe that observances, these rites, rituals, ceremonies, and worships are producing some kind of benefit, they'll keep doing those things, right? And I did those things for a long time myself, right? Thinking that, okay, this is what it's going to take in order to experience a better life, but it doesn't right? It doesn't give you any wisdom. You could go into a building, someone could sprinkle water on you, but if you go outside and you're bitter and harsh and hostile to people, your life's not going to be peaceful. 
right? You're not going to experience an improved and better way of life. It doesn't matter how many strings somebody ties on your wrist. It doesn't matter any of those things. Those things aren't going to lead to wisdom that helps you to conduct yourself in life in your relationships in a better way. So as long as the mind has wrong observances, it will stay hindered. It will stay bound by this fetter where it'll keep you trapped. It's a pollution that's in the mind. So you can get to a point where you eradicate these from the mind. Oftentimes, by the time someone comes and starts studying with me, they might have already eradicated wrong observances. They kind of have already figured out, yeah, these rites, rituals, ceremonies, and worship, it doesn't lead to any kind of improvement in my life. Maybe you've already done a certain amount of those things. So you'll need to get to the point where you can see the truth about the rites, rituals, ceremonies, and worship that it hasn't led to any improved state of mind. Your mind is just as angry or frustrated or bitter or harsh as it was before the rites, rituals, ceremonies, and worship and afterwards as well. But when you cultivate wisdom, that's what's actually going to improve the condition of your mind because now you're making improved decisions which are leading to improved results in your life. So this is wrong behavior and observances. What central desire is, this is where the mind has longing and yearning through the sense spaces. When we talk about craving, desire, attachment, the longing, yearning, the chasing after the objects of your affection, this is what we're talking about. Central desire. This is the fetter or the taint or the pollution that is inside the mind. We generally talk about it in all our beginner classes as craving, desire, attachment. It's longing and yearning. The mind is chasing after the objects of its affection, thinking the next new shiny object waiting around the corner is gonna provide some kind of lasting satisfaction. That's what we typically talk about. And we say, okay, if you get what you want and you're expecting, you'll get these pleasant feelings of happiness, excitement, elation, thrill, exhilaration, euphoria. But those feelings are conditioned based on some condition. And then when that condition changes, now the mind will end up in the painful feelings like sadness, anger, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear, stress, anxiety, all of these. So it's all coming from central desire where the mind is longing and yearning through the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, or the mind itself. It's called the six sense bases. Usually you learn the five senses, but in the teachings of the Buddha, he explains the mind as being a sixth sense. And here's how you can understand these, and here's how you can directly reflect on it. What you experience in the unenlightened state when you have central desire is that when you see a certain physical form and it's agreeable to you, you'll get pleasant feelings, happiness, excitement, elation. Like, oh, it's sunny outside. Ah, so excited. The sun is a physical form. You see it with your eyes and now you feel excited based on that central desire of, oh, I want it to be sunny. But now that you form that happiness based on the sun, when you go outside and you see that it's raining or there's some other weather condition, now the mind is going to experience the anger or the sadness or the frustration. Because if you base your inner feelings of happiness on something that you see, what you see is impermanent. So that means your feeling of happiness is also impermanent. You can't experience permanent pleasant feelings through things that you see or things that you hear or smell or taste or things that touch the body or things that go through the mind. So that now say you see a mother and a child walking down the street and they're holding hands and it's like, ah, oh, that's so lovely. Look at the mother and child walking down the street holding hands. Oh, that's so beautiful. That's so wonderful. But now you turn the corner and you see a parent slap their child across the face. <gasps> oh my goodness right? This might be disagreeable to you. Well, you can't control what other people do. You can't control what they do. All you can do is control your own mind. So if you have central desire where you're craving for every child to be a certain way, now when you see that, you see something agreeable, you'll get pleasant feelings. But when you see something disagreeable, you're going to get painful feelings like anger and sadness. But it's not the parent who slapped the child across the face that's causing your painful feelings, right? Now, we're not talking about was wise or unwise because I don't think it's wise to slap anybody, let alone a child, right? We're not talking about what's wise or unwise in the situation. We're talking about the central desire. What's causing your mind to be discontent when you see that parent slap their child across the face? Well, it's your central desire. It's the mind longing and yearning through the eyes, wanting things to be permanently agreeable. 
And when you get things that are agreeable, you get pleasant feelings. But when you experience contact through the six sense bases that is disagreeable, you get painful feelings. So let me give you another example, but with the ears this time. Say you're driving your car and you're at a stoplight and someone pulls up next to you with music and it's certain music that you find agreeable and you're like, all right, yeah, that's my jam. Yeah, all right, let's go, come on, party. All right, right? Well, you're feeling so great. You've formed your inner feelings based on the condition of hearing this agreeable sound. Your central desire is there, longing, yearning for things to be permanently pleasing. So when you hear that pleasing music, your mind experiences happiness and excitement, okay? But now you pull up to the next traffic light and somebody has a different type of music on, something that you th don't like. It's disagreeable to you. Because of your central desire, you're craving your desire, you have a certain desire to hear certain sounds. And now when you hear that sound that you find to be disagreeable, you'll get angry or frustrated or agitated or annoyed. Right? This is because of central desire. The mind is longing and yearning, it's craving, it's wanting, it's expecting things to be permanently pleasing. But you live in an impermanent world. It's not possible for things to be that way. So as long as you have central desire in your mind, you'll see things as agreeable and disagreeable. Same thing with odors. Maybe you walk down the street, you walk past a coffee shop or a flower shop and you smell the flowers coming out. Wow, that smells so great. I've never smelled something so great before. But now you walk a couple more steps and you smell the sewer. Oh, that's horrible. Oh my gosh. Well, it's just impermanence. That's all it is, right? It's just that you can't smell things that are permanently agreeable to you all the time, right? Those, that smell of the flowers is impermanent, but also the smell of the sewer, that's impermanent too. But if your mind's craving permanence, you'll get happy when you smell the flowers, and then when you smell the sewer, you'll be disgruntled and irritated and feeling maybe sad or angry or frustrated or some other discontent feeling. Right? So you can't smell things that are permanently agreeable. Same thing with the tongue. There are certain flavors that you find agreeable and certain flavors that you find disagreeable. Right? Certain foods that you eat, ah, that's so great, it's so wonderful. But then there are certain flavors, ah, that's horrible. Your mind is repulsed by it. And you actually make choices. Some people go to a restaurant and you'll sit there and look at a menu trying to figure out exactly what you're going to find to be agreeable. And then when the food comes, if it's disagreeable to you, you might be frustrated or irritated or annoyed or something like this. But you need to be able to train the mind that this, the purpose of this food is to sustain the body. It's not to please the mind. Oftentimes when we're eating food in the unenlightened state, we think the purpose of this food is to please the mind. So we will eat things that are pleasing, right? And I'm not saying that you should go out and eat things that you find to be horrible, but in fact, I am actually saying you should go out and eat things that you find to be horrible because it, what you're going to do in the unenlightened state is you're going to try to push things away. You're going to say that durian, ah, I'm never eating durian. There's no way I'm eating durian. Or I don't know, something that you, that you find to be displeasing, maybe some bitter or sour taste. Ah, oh, that's horrible. I'm never going to eat that ever again, right? This might be what you actually think is going to solve your problem, is pushing away this particular flavor. But all you're doing is allowing your central desire to continue. You're allowing the craving, the desire, the longing, the yearning to continue in your mind. So that now in situations where you eat food that you like, you'll be happy, you're excited, you'll feel good. But then in situations where you taste a certain flavor at a restaurant that you don't particularly like, or you go to your friend's house and they cook you food, and you're like, oh, that's horrible. I'm not gonna eat that, no way, right? And you're disgruntled or agitated or frustrated, right? So you can eliminate this central desire through the tongue where you look at food as just something to nourish the body. That's all it's for, it's something to nourish the body. It doesn't have to taste good in order to nourish the body. But of course, we try to make our food taste good. And if you can eat good food, great, eat good food. But you're not going to permanently be able to eat food that tastes flavorful. You're going to sometimes eat food that doesn't have a certain flavor that you would like to have. And if you can train your mind to eliminate central desire, no matter what food you eat, you can always be peaceful. You can always be joyful. But if you have central desire through the tongue, you can only be happy if you get what you want. 
And then when you taste a flavor that you don't like, you're going to be frustrated or annoyed or disappointed or something like this. But you can get to a point where any food you eat, you're completely fine with it. That you're not using food in order to please the mind. You're just using food to sustain the body. That's it. Right? So if you've ever eaten out of emotion where you've been angry or frustrated, or irritated, this is the mind trying to please its central desire through the tongue. Right? And the mind's trying to get to these pleasant feelings. Eating chocolate ice cream, maybe when you're angry or you're sad or you're frustrated. And the mind's trying to get these pleasant feelings through food. Right? So you can train your mind to just look at food as something to nourish the body and that's it. Right? And you'll still eat enjoyable food at different times, but not permanently. So therefore, no matter what situation you're in, you'll be able to re retain your peace and your joy. But if you have a craving for particular foods, you can only be happy when you get those particular foods. So this is central desire through the tongue. Then there's through the body, certain physical objects that come in contact with the body, like certain fabrics. Ah, that feels so good. Oh, I like that fabric. But then when some other fabric touches your body, you don't like it. And the mind's like, ah, oh, I don't like that. Right? I used to not like turtlenecks. And I used to wear turtlenecks. I, I felt like I was choking. Ugh, I don't like turtlenecks, right? So I needed to wear long sweaters. And I didn't like long sleeves either. So I needed to learn how to wear those things and be comfortable with that. Or say you're walking down the street and you're walking down the street and you're on the sidewalk and now everything's fine. You feel so pleasurable. But now somebody bumps into you. Their shoulder hits your shoulder. You might be disgruntled or angry. Right? This is because the mind has sensual desire. It wants things that's touching the body to be permanently pleasing. And it's just not possible for things to be touching the body that are permanently pleasing. This is the sensual desire where the mind's longing and yearning, wanting things to be touching the body that is permanently pleasing. Right? Or say like you stump your toe. You're walking through your house and you hit your toe on the end of a couch and now you're angry. Now you're frustrated. The mind is wanting this body to be permanently comfortable. And it's just not possible for this body to be permanently comfortable because it is impermanent. So therefore you're gonna experience things that are impermanent. The body's gonna sometimes feel comfortable and sometimes it's gonna be uncomfortable. This is normal, this is impermanence. But if your mind's craving for things that are touching this body to be permanently comfortable, you'll be frustrated, agitated, or annoyed as you age and you start feeling aches and pains, or your back is hurting, or you stump your toe, or somebody bumps into you, or there's a certain fabric on your body that you find displeasing and disagreeable, you'll be frustrated, agitated, or annoyed. And then there's the mind itself, which is part of central desire. The mind itself is longing and yearning that you might be thinking about things in the past, certain pleasurable things that happened in the past, and you get all these pleasant feelings and all these pleasant experiences based on these feelings and based on these experiences in the past. But then there's also things in your past that were quite traumatic and quite difficult to deal with and quite painful for you to deal with. So now in the present moment, as you're thinking about those things in the past, you can experience painful feelings. This is because of the sixth sense space of the mind, that the mind is thinking to the past and now either pleasurable or painful things that have happened in the past. In the present moment, if your mind's clinging to those things, you'll experience pleasant feelings or painful feelings in the present moment based on things that happened in the past. The mind will go up and down and up and down and up and down. And the same thing happens about the future. You can be thinking about certain things in the future, certain things that you're so excited about that you want to have happen in the future. And now the mind gets so excited about those things in the future. Or there could be certain things that you're fearful of or you have anxiety about the future. And now in the present moment, you can't reside peaceful and joyful because the mind is having this experience of thinking about something in the future. And now you're either experiencing these excited feelings or you're experiencing these painful feelings as a result. This is why you're training your mind to come to the present moment with your meditation. So the mind is a sixth sense space. So this is, this is central desire, where the mind is going up and down and up and down and up and down, experiencing discontentedness based on its central desire. It's craving, it's longing, it's yearning, it's wanting contact through the sixth sense spaces to be permanently agreeable when it's not possible because you live in an impermanent world. You're gonna experience impermanence. But as long as the mind has central desire where it's craving for things to be permanently pleasing, 
you'll experience this up and down and up and down because in some situations you'll get what you want in other situations you won't. So when you eradicate sensual desire, you can be peaceful and joyful no matter what because you don't have this agreeable and disagreeable thoughts in your mind. Like this is agreeable to me. This is disagreeable to me. You won't have that in your mind. It's just contact. It's not good music or bad music. It's just the sound, right? It's not a good food or bad food. It's just food that's touching the tongue and I need to chew it and digest it in order to keep the health of the body. It's not a good odor or a bad odor. It's just an odor. It's just a smell. It's just coming into the nose. It's just impermanent. Whatever it is, whether it's something like flowers or the sewer, it's just impermanent. No need to cling to it and hold on to it, wanting it to be permanent. Somebody bumps into you. Okay. Sorry. Maybe I bumped into you. (laughs) Maybe you didn't bump into me. Maybe I bumped into you, right? So no need to get shaken up by all these impermanent experiences because you're going to experience all this impermanence all around you. So this is central desire. With central desire in the mind, then there will be ill will. What ill will is the hostility, the aggression, the bitterness, the resentfulness. And it oftentimes comes through in your intentions, your speech, and your actions. But this is a pollution, This this is like a deeply rooted container in the mind. Every single one of these are. What ill will is, is this is the anger, the bitterness, the hostility. This is where the mind is uh, being vengeful towards others. That's how it manifests. But inside the mind, this is the hatred, the anger. So with central desire in the mind, if you get what you want, you'll get happy, you'll get excited. But when you don't get what you want, that's when your ill will will arise and you'll start wishing harm on others. Or you might actually be doing things overtly through your intention, speech, and actions, interested in causing harm to others due to the mind's ill will, right? You might be trying to turn people's screws and trying to mess with them a little bit, right? Or maybe a lot of it. You might be hostile or aggressive towards others in your intention, speech, and actions. But you can eradicate this ill will through loving kindness meditation, which is what I'm going to be teaching on Wednesday. Wednesday, I'll be teaching this actually all next week in our Harmony and Relationships course that starts tomorrow. I'll be teaching about love and kindness and how to produce harmonious relationships. But as long as you have ill will in your mind, you'll find it difficult to have harmonious relationships. You'll be in situations where you won't be getting what you want and you will falsely attribute that to somebody else. And now your ill will will arise and you'll be bitter, harsh, and hostile to others. Again, not because you're a bad person or you've done anything wrong. It's just because of these pollutions that are in the mind. And these can be uprooted and eradicated from the mind through training of the mind. The Buddha provides you the tools and techniques to be able to actually do this. So I'm going to pause here because the first five fetters are actually quite extensive. They're quite detailed. The last five fetters won't take as long for me to explain, but I would like to pause here and see if you guys have any questions on the first five fetters. Remember, you can use the microphones here at the temple or those of you guys online, you can put it into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or you can raise your hand electronically in Zoom and ask any questions that you like. So do you guys have any questions on these first five fetters? Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for a lecture. Um, I have a question about the, the second one, doubt. So the first question, uh, I have two questions and mm-hmm. doubt. Um, so the doubt here, it refers only for the teaching, um, teaching about the Buddha's word or, mm-hmm. or just the kind of um, usual doubt like the people, uh, um, parents said to children, don't believe the stranger. So there are a lot of doubts. So when we live in this world, or, but uh, here the doubt is only default to the words. Um, so this is the first question. Yes. So these are the fetters that are going to hinder you from getting to enlightenment. Mm. So if you have doubt about the Buddha, the teachings, the community, your teacher or your own ability to get to enlightenment, this will hinder you from getting to enlightenment. And what you do is, like I mentioned, investigate the teachings. You can turn it into an inquisitive mind. You can say, hey, you know what? I do have doubt. 
And I'm sure that you have doubt. I'm sure. Yeah. Right. And now what you do is you turn that into an inquisitive mind. You roll up the sleeves, you sink your teeth in. You're like, yeah, I doubt the teachings of the Buddha hundred percent. Now let me figure out if they're true or false. Let me investigate mm-hmm. them. And that's how you eradicate your doubt. So we're not talking about the, the doubt that the mind might have about like, I doubt that I'm going to be able to go home and stay dry. Mm-hmm. on my motorbike I will probably get wet today I doubt that I'll be able to stay yeah. dry right that's not the doubt we're talking okay, about thank here you. yeah <laughs> just, just as confused the doubt there's a lot of doubt so maybe it's a, doubt, a lot of in, um, advertisement so maybe we we should doubt about that yeah. but, okay so here the doubt is, is referring about the teaching Right. Uh, from Buddha. Okay. Because this doubt that I'm talking about, like I doubt I'll be able to go home and stay dry, that's not going to hinder you okay. from getting to okay. enlightenment, <laughs> right? But this doubt will hinder you from getting to enlightenment. Okay. Thank you so much. So mm-hmm. I think so my, so you, or, or, uh, most of you answered my question about two, a second one, but uh, uh, to eliminate or to get rid of the doubt here. So um, maybe, um, so, as we mentioned, so first place, um, obs- maybe observe or um, try, um, try, uh, try to do uh, what the Buddha said, and then investigate by myself. Then, so um, gradually, maybe so the doubt eliminated or um, got rid of, right? Yes, as you're investigating the teachings slowly but surely, mm-hmm. and you. At through your examination that you're reflecting on those to independently verify them you can start seeing more and more that the teachings are true mm-hmm. and then as you're practicing them mm-hmm. this is where you can really see they're true mm-hmm. because as the mind's becoming more peaceful and joyful yeah. you'll get to a point where you have no doubt that okay. these teachings are the truth um, you won't be enlightened yet but you'll have seen a significant amount of improvement to the condition of your mind that you'll have eliminated your doubt. And okay. that's usually happening as you move into the jhanas, those okay. four preliminary phases yeah. before the mind gets to the first stage of enlightenment. That's okay. usually where it happens. But I've had some people that experience the elimination of doubt even before then. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you. So maybe, I actually, so I could see, so how it, so, um, the lecture, um, uh, reflect to me so it's kind of uh, the, um, the process of the kind of uh, getting something nice mm-hmm. <laughs> okay Th- thank you so much yes you're I welcome appreciate. Mm-hmm. you're very welcome take a look here online I don't, oh here we have a question I think what is a good practice to eliminate personal existence view if you look at Volume one, chapter 16 of the book, that's where I detail that because I usually spend about an hour and a half, two hours just talking about that. So it's better if you uh, look at that. Um, You'll see an exhaustive list of all the various things that you can use to proactively work to eliminate personal existence view. I'm not focusing so much today on the elimination of these things. Um, I'm really talking about what they are uh, because the elimination of these things needs to be coupled with the Eightfold Path. And people who are just starting out in this program, they haven't yet fully developed the Eightfold Path. So it doesn't make sense for me to go in and talk about each one individually of how to eliminate them. So I'm really more focused on what they are at this point. But the retreat that I'm going to teach in August, I'm going to go into each individual fetter, talk about what it is, what the symptoms of it are, um, how to eliminate it, and how to know when you've actually eliminated it as well. So I'll be talking about those four different things. But for that one, you can look in volume one, chapter 16. Okay, so I'm not seeing any other questions anywhere. So let's move into the higher fetters. These are a lot more straightforward, kind of easier to explain. Number six and seven are actually very similar. This is called desire for form and desire for formless. What this is is where you have a desire to exist in either the form realms or the formless realms. What this is is the form realms or the animal realm or the human realm. If you have a desire, if you're longing, yearning, if you're holding on to this existence in the human realm, or you have the same thing for the animal realm. Some people want to be reborn as a bird or a dog or a cat or something like this. If you have a desire to exist in the cycle of rebirth, it's gonna hinder you from getting to enlightenment because as you're getting close to death, 
you'll be holding on to this world. You, you will have a very painful death, right? So that's what desire for form is. Desire for formless is where you have a desire to be reborn in one of the formless realms, hell, afflicted spirits, or heavenly realm. There are people who have a desire to be reborn in hell. There are those kinds of individuals in the world. There's people who desire to be reborn in afflicted spirit realm, which is like a ghost realm. And then there's plenty of people who have a desire to be reborn in the heavenly realm. Now, none of these realms are permanent, right? This human existence is not permanent, just like an existence in the heavenly realm is not permanent. And this is the challenge with many people in the world is they're thinking that the heavenly realm is permanent. And this is one of the reasons why they have a desire to be reborn there. And they think that it's such a wonderful place to be. Well, oftentimes beings in the heavenly realm are having complacency. They're only experiencing pleasant feelings. So therefore they tend to be complacent and they don't develop their practice to be able to get to enlightenment. And oftentimes from the heavenly realm, they're reborn down into the lower realms of hell, afflicted spirits or animal realm, or even back into the human realm. So re being reborn in the heavenly realm is not the goal that's going to ultimately help you. Now that you're in this human state, it's the perfect ideal existence to be able to get to enlightenment you can make your way to enlightenment. But if you have desire to exist in the form realm or the formless realms, you won't do the work to actually get to enlightenment in this life. So this is a hindrance or an obstruction or a fetter or a taint or a pollution keeping you trapped in the unenlightened state. So you need to get rid of that where you realize like, hey, I'm not interested in existing and holding on to this world but I'm also not craving non-existence either. This is really important that you understand that there is an existence, that you're in this existence. You're not craving to exist, but you're not craving non-existence either, that you can just be content and peaceful in the present moment. That's what you ultimately would like to get to. By the time you eliminate these fetters, you won't have any fear of death whatsoever by the time you eliminate desire for form and desire for formless. And there are certain tools and techniques that I share with you to help you learn how to eliminate any kind of fear of death or clinging to this physical form, wanting to stay in this world. Then the eighth one is conceit. This is part of the ego. What this is, is this is the arrogance, the pride, the measuring and comparing, thinking that you're above people or below people. This is judging other people. This is what conceit is. It's pridefulness, it's boastfulness, it's arrogance, right? We refer to this as the ego, but personal existence view in conceit is what we refer to as the ego. And we'll talk about that in chapter 16 when we get to that. So this conceit, it's going to hinder you in your enlightenment because as long as you have conceit, you'll think you're so great and others aren't, right? And you'll talk down to people. And where this is coming from is this is coming from our animal existences, that in our animal existences, we needed conceit. We needed a pecking order in our animal existences. We needed to know who's the alpha male and alpha female of our wolf pack because they're teaching us how to hunt. We need to know we, our survival is dependent on who's the alpha male and who's the alpha female. When we were a herd of elephants, we needed to know who's the matriarch of our herd. She's gonna show us where to eat. She's gonna show us the watering holes. She's gonna show us the migration paths. We need to know who's the matriarch of our elephant herd, right? If we didn't know that, we'd be lost. Right? So we needed this pecking order in our animal existences. And we've had so many different animal existences that our mind has been conditioned in such a way that now in the human realm, it's holding on to that. And now when we're in the human realm, in the unenlightened state, when you have conceit, you might be looking for a pecking order. Where am I in this pecking order? And now when you're in a certain social situation, you might be trying to figure out who am I above and who am I below? And the people that you feel like you're above, you talk down to people. And the people who you feel like you, you are below, you feel diminished or degraded when you're around them. And you feel kind of shaken up or uncalm when you're around maybe a boss who you admire. Or maybe if you met a certain celebrity that you really admire, you might be shaken up around that person. Or maybe if you met the president of your country or the prime minister, you might be all shaken up. Or the king of Thailand, right? You might be all shaken up by meeting this person, right? Because you admire this person so much and you feel like they're so high above you. So even though other people might think of themselves as being above you, or they might think of themselves as being below you, it's important that your mind eradicates the conceit where you don't think of yourself as being above people and you don't think of yourself as being below people. 
so that you can get to a permanent practice. Whereas if you think of yourself as above people, you're gonna talk down to people in one way, and when you're thinking that you're below people, you're gonna talk up to those people in a different way. And now when you're a mixed company, when you're in like a social situation, your mind's having to obsessively figure out who am I above and who am I below? And your mind's gonna have to constantly be switching between two different modes of I talk to these people in this way and I talk to these people in that way. And your mind's having to figure this out. And it's a real burden to the mind. But if you can get to a practice where you see everybody as equal, you treat everybody the same. Polite, kind, friendly, and respectful. When you're meeting the president or the king of Thailand, you can just be polite, kind, friendly, and respectful. You treat them the same exact way as when you walk down the street and you see someone sweeping the street. Hello, sir, how are you? Good morning, right? The same exact way. And now you have a permanent practice that you just treat everybody exactly the same way. And that's what you can do when you eliminate the conceit. Because when you have conceit in your mind and you're arrogant and boastful and prideful, people will push you away. People will push you away and reject you because they don't like being around that. Right? When you're starting to be boastful and arrogant and prideful, they'll just push you away and they'll be uninterested in spending time with you. But when you can be humble and you can be down to earth and you can treat everybody equally, now you can relate to all people the same way and your mind can be at ease. Then number nine, this is restlessness, right? Restlessness is that obsessive part of the mind, that overthinking, the overactivity of the mind, the shaking up of the mind. And the way that you eliminate this is by eliminating craving, desire, attachment. That if you're sitting somewhere and your knees bouncing around like this, or if you're tapping and tapping and tapping with your fingers, or you have a pencil and you're constantly tapping, it's the mind is overactive. There's restlessness in the mind. You can't sit still. You have to constantly be moving around. This is the restlessness in the mind. This is because of craving, desire, attachment. It's not content in the present moment. So if you eradicate this restlessness, then you can just be still and calm and steady and stable, right? The mind can be unshakable. But as long as there's this restlessness in the mind, the mind will be overactive and you'll be constantly wanting to be on the go. Go, 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 go. I can't just be still somewhere, right? So there's certain training that you can employ to eliminate this restlessness. And then the 10th fetter, this is the fetter of all fetters. It's because of this fetter that all the others exist. If it wasn't for this fetter, then all those other ones would already be gone. This last fetter is called ignorance. This is what people refer to it as. But this word is kind of like a derogatory word nowadays, right? Like if we refer to someone as ignorant, it would be like talking down to them. A Buddha and an enlightened being, they wouldn't talk with this kind of arrogance and pride, they wouldn't talk down to people in degrading and diminishing ways. So I prefer to use the phrase unknowing of true reality or misunderstanding or confusion or misperception. That's what this is really referring to. But I use the word ignorance because that's what a lot of other teachers use. So if you ever end up coming across somebody else's teachings, you understand what they're teaching here. What this means is the unknowing of true reality, the misperception, the misunderstanding, the delusion, the confusion that the mind has, that the mind doesn't understand what it doesn't understand. The mind doesn't understand all these 10 fetters. The mind doesn't understand the three universal truths or the four noble truths or the eightfold path or the five precepts. It doesn't understand meditation training. It doesn't understand in the unenlightened state that you are causing your own discontent feelings. We just don't understand. We walk around the world thinking that other people are causing us to be angry. That's what we think because of our ignorance, because of our unknowing of true reality. But when you investigate the teachings of the Buddha and you reflect on them to independently verify them for yourself and you practice, you can see that it's your own mind causing your own discontentedness because now you have wisdom. That's the exact opposite of this ignorance or the unknowing of true reality. So this ignorance or this unknowing of true reality is the thing that's keeping the mind trapped in the unenlightened state that it just doesn't understand what it doesn't understand. That's what ignorance is. Any questions on any of these fetters? Okay. So now what I'm going to show you, well, let's see what we've got here. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Pleased to help you. Yep, volume one, chapter 16. Okay, so now what I'm going to share with you is the four stages of enlightenment. 
as you're eliminating the 10 fetters and eradicating those from the mind, your mind's going to move through these four stages of enlightenment. There's a lot of work that you'll need to do in order to even get to this point. You're going to need to put together the Eightfold Path, which includes your meditation practice. You're going to need to build up a regular, consistent meditation practice. But there's other things you're going to need to learn, too. You're going to need to improve your moral conduct right? It doesn't matter how much you're meditating. If you go out in the world and you're bitter, harsh, and hostile with people through your speech and actions, you're not going to be able to get to enlightenment, right? Enlightened being isn't going to go out in the world and be bitter, harsh, and hostile with people, right? So you're going to need to learn the Eightfold Path, which encompasses many different things. And as you are, as you're developing that more and more to include meditation, you'll start experiencing the jhanas, at a particular point. You'll start noticing these heightened qualities of mind that you'll start experiencing. Then you'll ultimately start needing to focus on the 10 fetters, particularly those first three, right? You're going to need to start wearing those away. And as you're wearing those away, you're going to start moving through these four stages of enlightenment. Stream enter, once returner, non-returner, and otter hunt. What a stream enter is, is this is the first stage of enlightenment. The once returner is the second stage. The non-returner is the third stage. And the fourth stage is called Arahant. The Buddha referred to the first stage of enlightenment as a stream enter for a reason. Because once you become a stream enter, once you get to the first stage of enlightenment, you are going to get to enlightenment. It's only a matter of time. Just like a log, when it enters the stream, it's going to eventually get to the ocean. The same thing is true that once you enter the stream, you're going to eventually get to enlightenment. It's only a matter of time. So as you're eliminating the first three fetters, and there's some other things you need to do as well. That's why the retreat I teach in January is all about getting to the first stage of enlightenment. When you eradicate these first three fetters, you will enter into the stream. You will be in the first stage of enlightenment. And you will know that to be true for yourself because you will know that you had a significant decrease in discontentedness. You will have seen it occur over many months and years. You will have seen this gradual decreasing of discontentedness. And there's certain things that you're going to need to learn and develop in order to accomplish that. And that's why I have that retreat in January to help people get to this first stage of enlightenment. They won't be to the first stage of enlightenment at the end of the retreat, but everything in that retreat is there to help you understand how to get to the first stage of enlightenment. Okay. If you die in this stage of enlightenment, you will come back to the human realm no more than seven times. You're not going to come back for sure for seven times, but no more than seven times if you die in this stage of enlightenment. But also you can continue from there that if you're, you know, continuing to practice, you could then get to this second stage, which we call once returner. From here, you've already eliminated the first three fetters, but you've kind of thinned out number four and five. You've thinned out sensual desire and ill will. So if you're noticing that you're less interested in sex, this is a decreasing of sensual desire. Depending on your age, <clears throat> you might notice that your sensual desire has decreased, right? This is normal. Some people think there's something wrong with them if their sensual desire is decreasing <clears throat> or if they're less interested in sex. There's nothing wrong. It's actually a really good thing that your mind's less interested in basing its inner feelings on some external thing. So if you're noticing your sensual desire gradually decreasing, this will actually promote more peace and more joy in your mind. Because as long as you have sensual desire, you can only be happy when these certain things are happening right? So the number of things that need to happen in order for you to be happy become more and more and more. So the amount of time that you're able to stay happy becomes fewer and fewer and fewer. But when you get rid of your central desire, where you're craving for things to be a certain way, your amount of happiness goes up. The amount of joy goes up because, hey, I can be happy when it's sunny and I can be happy when it's raining and I can be happy when there's a blizzard and I can be happy when there's an earthquake and I can be happy when there's a tornado. I'm not happy because of the tornado. I'm happy despite the tornado, right? I'm happy despite the hurricane or despite the typhoon, right? I can be happy when my bank account's this and I can be happy when my bank account's this. I'm not happy because of the bank account. I'm just happy because I'm happy because I don't want things to be any particular way. The mind can just be joyful all the time. When mom does this, I'm happy. When mom does this, I'm happy. It's up to mom. Whatever mom would like to do, up to her, right? But if you want mom to do things a certain way based on your central desire, you can only be happy when she does things your way, right? So the number of or the amount of time that you can be happy becomes fewer and fewer and fewer and less and less and less, right? So 
If you're noticing that your sensual desire is decreasing, this is actually really helpful for the mind. It's going to become more peaceful and more joyful. And because your sensual desire is decreasing, you'll notice that your ill will will decrease too. These two fetters are together. That as your sensual desire is going down, your ill will is going to go down too because you're not wanting things to be a certain way. Whereas if you want things to be a certain way and it's not that way, your anger will arise. But when your sensual desire is going down, you're more and more peaceful, more and more joyful, less and less ill will, less anger, less hostility, less bitterness. So this is the second stage of enlightenment called one's returner. If you die in this stage of enlightenment, you will come back to the human realm one more time before you actually get to enlightenment. So some of you might have been a once returner in your past life. And now this is your opportunity to get to enlightenment. You don't necessarily know that, right? The goal is to stay focused on the path and actually get to enlightenment in this life. Okay, so this is the first and second stage of enlightenment. Then there's the third stage, which is called non-returner. This person has eliminated all three fetters, right? They've, or I'm sorry, all five of the lower fetters. Personal existence view, doubt, wrong behavior and observances, central desire and ill will. By the time you get to the third stage of enlightenment, your life is super peaceful. You're experiencing discontentedness like once every three months, once every six months. You're experiencing a little bit of ickiness here and there. It's so insignificant that you can actually become complacent in this third stage of enlightenment because it happens for maybe five seconds, maybe 10 seconds. You just feel a little bit, eh, a little bit ickiness but it only happens like once every three months, once every six months. So you can become complacent here and you can think like, ah, you know, no worries, but you need to stay diligent and dedicated to stamp out that craving, desire, attachment that's producing that so that then you can make your way to enlightenment because an enlightened being is going to have eliminated all the 10 fetters. And when you fully purify the mind of all 10 fetters, this is where you experience the peace and the joy of the enlightened mind. Okay. This is referred to as an arahant. If you die in the stage of enlightenment of non-returner, you actually are reborn into the heavenly realm and you attain enlightenment there and you won't come back to any realm whatsoever. But you shouldn't ever bank on this and you should never consider that this is what you're going to actually accomplish. <clears throat> Keep focusing on getting to arahant where you eliminate all 10 fetters. If you die in the stage of enlightenment as an otter hunt, <clears throat> you're not going to be reborn into the cycle of rebirth. The Buddha doesn't describe what comes next. <clears throat> Once you get to enlightenment and die, he doesn't say what's next. And I have various reasons why I think he doesn't teach this, but nonetheless, he doesn't say whether you do exist or you don't exist. Sometimes people think that once you get to enlightenment, you no longer exist anymore. But the Buddha doesn't actually teach this. This is a misunderstanding of his teachings. He actually leaves it as an undeclared teaching. So once you pur fully purify the mind of all 10 fetters, this is where the mind is experiencing peace and joy permanently. For the next one year, two years, three years, you notice that your mind's not experiencing any discontentedness whatsoever. And you'll know that your mind is enlightened. You'll notice focus, concentration, clarity, deep memory. Your personal, professional relationships will be blossoming. You'll notice that you get along with everybody with ease. You'll have harmony in your relationships. You'll never even be in a bad mood anymore. That when you wake up, you're already in a good mood. You look outside, it's sunny. Okay, let's go outside. Let's have fun. You go take a shower. You come back, it's raining. Okay, it's raining. Well, I guess I'm going to do something else, right? And you change plans. No big deal. You won't be upset. You won't be frustrated. Your mind for one year, two years, three years, you'll notice there's no discontentedness whatsoever because you fully purified the mind. Okay, any questions on the four stages of enlightenment? Okay, so since there's no questions there, the very last thing that I'll share with you, and I usually share this in a lot of the other classes that I teach too, is what is a fully perfectly enlightened Buddha? What is a fully perfectly enlightened one? This is not a stage of enlightenment. Oftentimes people say, everybody's a Buddha, or you have Buddha nature. This isn't actually true. While other people might say that today, the Buddha never said that. It's very rare for there to be a Buddha in the world. A Buddha meets three primary criteria. The first criteria is that they get to enlightenment on their own without the help of any teachers or any guides. That's the first criteria. The second criteria is that they dedicate the rest of their life to sharing their independently discovered teachings with countless people. And countless people get to enlightenment. And then the third criteria is that they preserve their teachings in such a way that countless people get to enlightenment after their death. 
that once they die, their teachings have been preserved so that countless more people can continue to get to enlightenment. These are the three criteria of what makes a Buddha a Buddha. They get to enlightenment by themselves without the help of any teachers or any guides. They dedicate the rest of their life to sharing their independently discovered teachings and countless people get to enlightenment during their lifetime. And then the third criteria is that they need to preserve their teachings so that other people can get to enlightenment after their death. These are the three main criteria, and it's very rare for a Buddha to exist in the world. The last one that the world's currently aware of existed over 2,500 years ago, and the people that are alive today aren't aware of any Buddha that has existed since then. So you can get to enlightenment, you will experience the peace and joy of the enlightened mental state, but you won't be a Buddha at that point. Your mind will be enlightened, or you'll be an arahant, but you won't identify in that way, right? If you identify as I am am an enlightened being, well, you haven't even gotten to the first stage of enlightenment because there's still personal existence view there, right? So your mind won't identify that way. It's just you'll know that the mind is enlightened, right? So this is what a Buddha is, meets those first three criteria. There's other criteria too. A Buddha has a deep, profound memory that they can remember countless details about their current life and their previous lives as well. This is what allows them to get to enlightenment without the help of any teachers or any guides. You're going to need teachers and you're going to need guides because you don't have this profound memory where you can remember countless details about your current life and your previous lives as well. So you have a certain capacity in your mind. It's like a hard drive. You have like 500 gigabytes or one terabyte. And when you have new experiences, you need to delete old files in order to store new files because you have a limited capacity to your hard drive. This is why you have spotty memories about your childhood. You just kind of remember a few things here or there. But a Buddha doesn't experience that. A person who's going to become a Buddha, they have an unlimited capacity in their mind to remember countless details about their current life and their past life to the point that they can bring forth all that wisdom from all these countless lives to apply it in their last life and actually get to enlightenment without the help of any teachers or any guides. So this is another criteria of what makes a Buddha a Buddha. They're going to have a profound memory. And then they actually use that to be able to help their students because they can remember things <clears throat> about the teachings and about their students that other teachers aren't able to do. Also, a Buddha can quickly determine the condition of someone else's mind by spending time with that person because those 10 fetters, they're very familiar with those 10 fetters. So a Buddhist spending time with somebody, they can see those fetters coming through and they can identify those fetters and other people. And then a Buddha has a deep practice of their teachings. They're a living, breathing, walking example of their teachings. They don't teach one thing and then do something different, right? They don't teach you to not lie and then they go outside and they lie. Or they don't teach you to speak gentle, and then they go outside and they're bitter and harsh and hostile. A Buddha is teaching just as much through their actions as they do through their spoken words. A Buddha is wise enough to get to enlightenment by themselves without the help of any teachers or any guides. They're also wise enough to understand that their students are learning through their actions, their verbal actions, their bodily actions, and their mental actions. So a Buddha is going to be a living, breathing, walking example of their teachings so that their students can learn from them and they can learn how to conduct themselves as an enlightened being. So you won't find that a Buddha will have any contradictions in their teachings or that they'll have a contradiction in their practice, that they will be teaching something and they'll actually be practicing that particular thing. Right. This is this is the criteria of what makes a Buddha a Buddha. And we refer to them as fully, perfectly enlightened because they don't have any teachers. They don't have any guides. By the time they get to enlightenment, what they understand is deep wisdom, profound wisdom about what it takes to get to enlightenment. Whereas if you learn from a certain teacher, you might hold on to certain things that didn't lead to your enlightenment. Maybe 70, 80, 90% of what you know led to your enlightenment, but you're still holding on to a few other things that didn't actually lead to your enlightenment. By the time somebody gets to enlightenment as a Buddha, they don't have that because they don't have any teachers or any guides. So when a Buddha is meditating, for example, if it works to improve the condition of your mind, they know that that is what leads to enlightenment and they will teach that. But if they try a certain meditation and it doesn't work, they will discard it 
and they will throw it to the side or any particular teaching. If it doesn't work, they will discard it and throw it to the side where a person who is maybe learning from a teacher, they might try to hold on to something that doesn't actually lead to their enlightenment, but they're just kind of holding on. Maybe 90% of what they know actually led to their enlightenment, but there's this extra baggage that's around. But if you're learning directly from a Buddha, you're going to be learning exactly what it takes to get to enlightenment. All right, so any questions on what a Buddha is? Remember online, you can put that into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or you can raise your hand in Zoom and ask any questions that you like. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions anywhere. So I'm gonna end here by thanking all of you guys for joining. Thank you for your interest to learn the teachings of the Buddha, whether you're here at the temple or you're joining online. Thank you for your dedication to grow and develop as an individual. Because as you're learning and practicing these teachings, it's helping you. It's helping those that are close to you as you're becoming more and more peaceful. It's helping the people around you. And it's helping all of humanity become a better and better place. So I always like to say thank you to the students for learning and practicing these teachings because it's helping everyone, including yourself. Next class on Sunday, we're going to be starting chapter one of volume one. This is where we're going to go chapter by chapter by chapter from this point forward all the way through the rest of the group learning program. Chapter one is titled Universal Teachings, Love, No Harm, and Good Morals. This is where you're going to learn about the three universal teachings that are going to connect for you. Things like Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity, Muslim teachings, things like this. They're all going to, you're going to see these kind of commonality between all of these teachings. Universal love of all beings, do no harm, and be a good moral person. This is kind of what they're all sharing, but I'm going to help you to understand that in more detail next Sunday. This Wednesday, I'm going to be teaching the uh, four-part series on loving kindness meditation as far as we start tomorrow we're going to be doing uh, harmony and relationships from monday through friday from 9 a.m to 3 p.m i'm going to have a class here and i'm going to be live streaming it as well it's going to be recorded so if you can't attend live you can attend there it's available at no cost to you where the things that i'm going to be teaching in that program i haven't really written about them the very first day is the eightfold path and the three poisons but after that i haven't written about this these things very much because uh, it's better to learn them in person. The core of that program is learning about true love. Because if you don't understand what true love is, you're not going to be able to have harmonious relationships. So if you're finding that you're having broken relationship after broken relationship after broken relationship, this is because your mind just lacks the wisdom. It has that ignorance, the unknowing of true reality. It lacks wisdom of what is true love. So you may not be practicing true love because you're not understanding what it is. And as long as you're not practicing true love, you're not going to experience true love coming back to you. So that's the real focal point of that course is to help you guys understand what is true love so that you can practice it and then you can identify it when other people are practicing it with you. And I'm going to be teaching loving kindness meditation as part of that course too. So if you'd like to attend, you're more than welcome. Or if you'd like to watch online or attend online, you're more than welcome. So perhaps I'll see you guys in one of these future classes or one of these retreats or courses. If there's anything that you would like help with, just feel free to let me know. I'm here to help you. Have a very lovely and wonderful rest of your day. We'll see you next time. Sawadikap.
you again for watching. Enjoy your meditation. Look forward to seeing you online and answering any questions that you might have. Thank you so much. Thank you.